Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Chris Whipple is with us. Chris is a man for all seasons, an author, documentary filmmaker, and TV producer. His latest book, The Fight of His Life, is about the first two years of the Biden presidency. With remarkable access to Biden's inner circle, including White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, CI Director Bill Burns, and even the president himself, Chris takes us inside the Oval Office, where the Biden team makes the key decisions. Many books lose their relevancy as events overtake them. This book acquires greater relevancy every day with the president's fight continuing as he confronts the classified documents investigation, the resignation of Ron Klain, the balloon, and the debt ceiling crisis. We're delighted to welcome Chris Whipple back to the program. Now, great to be with you. Chris, congratulations on your book. It's an important book and a great contribution to the historical record. And, uh, Thanks for the kind I'm, words. I'm always uh, curious about titles, The Fight of His Life. Uh, what did you mean when you wrote The Fight of His Life? You know, it, it, Jim, it, Joe Biden, I think you could argue that his entire life, his whole career has been a fight against adversity and tragedy and bad luck. He lost his wife and infant daughter in a car crash. He lost his son, Bo, uh, to a brain tumor. He, he, he ran and lost the race for presidency twice. Uh, his father always said, get up, and he did. He, may, he got up and he won the presidency at last. Uh, and I think that only to be confronted by a Russian tyrant invading a democracy in the heart of Europe. And I call that the fight of his life. Um, and hence the title. But at the time uh, you wrote the book, uh, we didn't know that uh, classified documents would be discovered in his office and in his home. And uh, we uh, didn't know that China was going to send a, a surveillance balloon over the United yeah. States. We didn't know a lot. We I mean, didn't know a lot. When I started so, the book, we didn't even know that Putin would invade Ukraine. Uh, so maybe I, I got lucky with the title. It certainly felt, feels appropriate now. But, you know, my first two books, Jim, The Gatekeepers about the White House Chiefs of Staff, The Spy Masters about the CIA directors, covered something like 100 years of history between them. This book covers two. But this was the biggest challenge. This was tougher than either of my previous books because when you try to write about write history, about a, a White House in progress, it's like designing an airplane in mid-flight. You're getting, you're getting buffeted by a COVID variant that comes out of nowhere and a, you, an invasion in Europe that comes uh, from somewhere else. You, you don't know where you're gonna land. You're just hoping you can land it safely. Um, so this book was a tremendous challenge to do, uh, particularly because it, compounding that was the fact that this is the most battened down, disciplined, leak-proof, on-script White House in recent memory. And of course, I had to get inside and I had to get the key players to talk to me candidly. And it's all the more rewarding uh, having been able to do that. Well, your principal source uh, of course, was the White House Chief of Staff, Ron Klain. No secret from reading the book, you're quite a fan of his. What do you see as his uh, strengths uh, now that he's, uh, he's left office and uh, Jeff Zients is... Well, you know, there's a reason why great White House chiefs are hard to come by, uh, because they have this extraordinarily rare skill set, which Klain had, uh, which James A. Baker III had under Ronald Reagan, which Leon Panetta had under Bill Clinton, but it's rare, and it's White House experience, it's knowledge of Capitol Hill, it's political savvy, it's a world-class temperament, which is an often unappreciated attribute for the great chiefs, but they all have it. Uh, and then there's the relationship with the boss. You've gotta have a really good working relationship, and nobody had a longer relationship than Ron Klein. 36 years working for Joe Biden, what that enables a White House chief to do is tell the president what he doesn't want to hear. 
there are numerous examples I can give you of, of Klein having done that. Um, one of my most dramatic scenes, I think, in the book was when I went to see Klein nine months into the presidency at the low point of the Biden presidency. Uh, Build Back Better, you remember, and <clears throat> the bipartisan infrastructure deal were twisting in the wind. Uh, Biden went off to Europe without empty-handed, in effect. He went to the Glasgow Climate Conference without anything to show for it. He had said, Biden himself had said at that time that the fate of his presidency depended on passing these bills and they were dead in the water. I went and saw Clay in that weekend, that Saturday, and we sat on the patio outside his West Wing office, and he told me he was considering resigning. This was nine months in. Long story, he decided to stay uh, because he wanted to see Biden through the midterms. And what he did, which only a White House chief of staff can do, is he sat, the, the president wanted to go everywhere and talk about everything, wanted to brag about his record. Um, Biden sat him down and said, Mr. President, you're going to go to the states where we think you could do the most good. And number two, you're going to talk about women's reproductive rights and the threat to democracy from MAGA. Well, Biden followed that script, and the rest is history. He defied the odds in those midterm elections. So that's an example of, of Klain's effectiveness. Do you see the role of the White House Chief of Staff as being the puppeteer and the president as the puppet? No, and, and, and you know I don't, having read The Gatekeepers. It's, it's, but it's a critical relationship. You have to have a, working, a good working relationship between the White House Chief and the president uh, to be effective. And every president learns, often the hard way, that you cannot govern effectively without empowering a White House Chief as first among equals to execute your agenda. It doesn't work if you have the famously, it was called the spokes of the wheel, where you've got six or seven or eight advisors coming and going into the Oval without anybody in charge. That's a recipe for disaster. And, and Biden, knowing, having been around and having seen the great ones and the not so good ones, he, he knows the importance of the chief. Well, uh, Klain was uh, well known for his collegial kind of style and uh, uh, bringing people into the tent. Uh, also uh, well known for being pretty hard-nosed. I mean, there no real leaks uh, during his tenure as chief of staff. And uh, uh, I can't think of any great dramatic moment as there were uh, yep. in the Trump administration who had four chiefs of staff and... Uh, uh, I guess four years. This is why I say, Jim, that the temperament is a really unappreciated attribute for the great chiefs. Baker had it, Panetta had it, uh, Klain has it. Uh, I think Jeff Zients has it, by the way, uh, Klain's successor. Klain never got too high when things were going well or too low when things were down, and he, was, he had this collegial uh, management style. Uh, everybody liked him. Let's look uh, at Biden's trajectory over uh, the two years. I mean, he joked in an offline at uh, the U.N. General Assembly that uh, he was like the guy who jumped off the Empire State Building, and when he reached the 50th floor, he said, uh, so far, so good. Yeah. Uh, we see he got high marks uh, really for restoring confidence after Trump. Um, uh, I would give him very high marks for that. Uh, but then also high marks for the pandemic. Uh, and then uh, they set in uh, some setbacks, Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, what was his problem over Afghanistan? Well, look, I see my book and the Biden presidency as a political thriller in three acts. The first act was, this, was the unbelievably fraught transition between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which was the most contentious and and bitter and, and, as it turned out, the bloodiest since the Civil War. And we didn't know the half of it. I mean, I have untold stories in my book about how it really came down to one uh, very low-profile Trump staffer, a deputy White House chief of staff, who under Trump's nose and without his knowledge kept the wheels of the transition turning, did all the necessary work to make sure that there was, in fact, a transfer of power at noon on January 20th. It's an incredible untold story, considering the oceans of ink that have been written about that period. 
Um, the second act was the first year of the Biden presidency, and that was largely overshadowed by the bungled exit from Afghanistan, uh, without a doubt. And that set off, a, a triggered a long slide in Joe Biden's approval rating. And it really shattered the notion that, uh, dented the notion that he, that, that competence was his brand. Um, <clears throat> and then the third act of the presidency, in, in my view, started on February 24, 2022, when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Joe Biden rose to meet that moment as only, I think, Joe Biden could have. He was, he was uniquely prepared for that moment in history. He'd spent his career preparing for this kind of a crisis, uh, even though nobody saw it coming until, um, in, in, until a few months before. But, um, but I think that was the turning point for, of this presidency. Uh, not long afterward, of course, he passed a string of, of legislation, including some bipartisan uh, legislation. And of course, it, it culminated in uh, defying all the expectations during the midterm elections in 2022. So I think those are the three acts. Um, Afghanistan is a story I tell in great detail, as you know. I don't know anybody else who has been able to talk to Ron Klain and Tony Blinken and General Mark Milley and CIA Director Bill Burns to get the inside story. Um, and what it, it, it was a lot more dramatic than you might have guessed behind closed doors. Uh, Tony Blinken told me in no uncertain terms that everything they did was based on a fatally flawed intelligence assessment that the Afghan government would last for 18 months. Now, this was news to CIA Director Bill Burns when I went and sat down with him over at Langley, and we talked about it, and, and, and Director Burns said, well, wait, hold it. He said, we were clear-eyed about the fragility of the Afghan. We said that if you p took away two legs of the stool, namely the U.S. military and the American contractors, that was a recipe for everything crumbling quickly. And General Mark Milley gave me yet another estimate in which he said, we, we were told they would last until Thanksgiving. At the end of the day. But isn't this a typical Washington blame game that uh, uh, one bureaucrat blames another bureaucrat uh, for whenever well, there's a governmental well, of failure? Of course, it always happens. It always happens when, when there's a, a, a disaster. Um, and at Langley, it, it, you may recall from my book on the CIA directors, the spy masters, that there's a saying out at Langley CIA headquarters uh, that uh, there are only policy success, in this town, there are only policy successes and intelligence failures. They always get blamed, right? So that is, is somewhat, uh, you know, not, not shocking to, to learn. Um, what, it, what was shocking to me was the extent to which, you know, we look at this White House and it's a very well-run operation and it looks pretty smooth on the surface. But what I discovered that there was there was all this furious paddling going on underneath, and 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 debate and and argument about uh, in this case how long the Afghan government would last. At the end of the day, they didn't have enough troops. They had a cap of 700 troops trying to get everybody out, um, and it's and clearly they expected the Afghan government to last longer than it did. Biden was furious. He was felt let down, he felt disappointed by his briefers. Um, and, um, but in fairness to Biden and his team, I would say this, that- He was disappointed with his briefers. Yeah. You know. when, in fairness to Biden and his team, I would say that the moment that Donald Trump, after that half-baked negotiation he had with the Taliban, the moment Trump announced that we would be out, the U.S. would be gone on May 1st, the writing was on the wall for the Afghan government and armed forces. They knew that, just as in Vietnam, they knew we were going to hit the road, and they hit the road first. But, uh, you know, foreign policy um, uh, diplomacy 101 is that if uh, you're going to withdraw, you don't tell the enemy the date you're going to withdraw. Uh, yeah, exactly. They always attack you on the way out. And uh, you have to anticipate there's going to be a problem. So that was 
a tremendous error of judgment, and you can l lay that at the feet of Donald Trump. Absolutely. Um, and among other things, uh, one of the problems they faced was that in March of 2020, the Trump administration had completely shut down the special visa program for getting uh, Afghans and allies of ours out of the country. Uh, it was inadequate to begin with, and the Biden uh, administration stepped it up when they came in. But it was just, you know, it was, it was nowhere near equal to the task of, of getting our friends and allies out. Uh, and there was also, I, I write about previously reported factor, which was that the CIA and the Defense Department were uh, having a feud uh, over who was going to be on those planes. Uh, and DOD had no idea that CIA was dumping its people on the tarmac uh, and they were clambering aboard the planes. And so th th this was not the uh, Biden administration's finest hour by a long shot. Uh, and perhaps not the CIA's final, uh, finest hour. Not theirs either. But uh, you move on to Ukraine, and there is a, a, both an intelligence success and a policy success because, number one, the CIA appreciated that uh, the Russian troops were massing on the border and would probably attack. And then there was a decision whether to keep that as a state secret uh, or to communicate it publicly. Uh, and they decided to communicate it publicly, and that uh, ended up uh, to the great advantage of uh, the alliance. I tell that story in, in the book, um, and a lot of people speculated. That's how I learned about it. How did, you know, how did this, who, who decide, whose decision was it, whose idea was it to take that intelligence about the, all of that disinformation that the Russians were putting out there, um, it, it faking uh, f faking events on the ground with dead bodies and all that stuff. Um, whose idea was it to weaponize that uh, intelligence and put it out there? Well, it turns out it was Joe Biden's. Uh, Milley was briefing him in the Oval Office and, and Biden couldn't believe what he was hearing. And he said, can you put that out? Can you make that public? And, and Milley said, I can't, Mr. President, but you can. And Avril Haines could, and she was the director of national intelligence uh, sitting a few seats away. So that, that was how that campaign uh, began. And it was, I think, one of the CIA's finest hours, not just weaponizing the intelligence against Putin and keeping him on his back foot, but they had Putin dead to rights. They had the blueprint for the invasion. They had the signals intelligence uh, to the point where Bill Burns was able to make a secret visit to Zelensky before the invasion and brief him and tell him exactly what was going to unfold and, and the Ukrainians were waiting for them. So uh, while we're on intelligence, uh, we have the affair of the documents. Uh, not in your book because you didn't know about it uh, when you went to press, but uh, what, is that uh, something that's going to blow over or do you think that uh, hurts Biden uh, tremendously? Well, I don't it, it, unless there's much more than meets the eye, I, I think it's, I, I don't think we're going to be talking about it during the 2024 election. I think it'll be in the rearview mirror. That's assuming Biden is the candidate. Yeah, and he will be. He's running. Trust me. Uh, but I think it takes off the table the prospect of prosecuting Donald Trump for the documents at Mar-a-Lago. Merrick Garland would have to think long and hard about picking a jury for that case, knowing that the jury probably wouldn't find it all that egregious when documents keep surfacing every other day in, in Biden's houses. I, I, I just think that's got to be a factor. So I think it'll have that effect, but, but I, think, I don't think we'll be talking about it in 2024. If he's a candidate, will uh, Kamala Harris be the vice presidential Without nominee? A doubt. Without a doubt. Has he lost confidence in Kamala Harris? What's her performance rating? Well, it's a, it's a complicated, fascinating relationship, and I, and I write about it in the book. Um, at the beginning, I think they had a genuine bond, and I, and I think they probably still do. Uh, Joe Biden, in, in the early stages, always wanted her in almost every meeting. He, uh, he valued her input. He sometimes followed her lead. She was great at questioning uh, briefers and staffers. It, we, she's got those prosecutorial chops. Uh, Biden appreciated all that, um, liked her. Um, things got a little bit trickier, dicier, when 
she began to have some missteps over uh, <clears throat> the Northern Triangle, for example, that trip to Guatemala where she fumbled that question from Lester Holt of NBC about the border and began to take fire. Um, and what happened was that some of her allies were complaining uh, that, and publicly, that she had been given Mission Impossible in effect, that her portfolio was too difficult. Nobody could really do anything about the Northern Triangle. Voting rights was a really heavy lift. Uh, she was being set up to fail. Well, Biden also heard through the grapevine that the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, was going around saying this to friends around town. And this just didn't sit well with Joe Biden. Um, he, he hadn't asked her to do anything he hadn't done as vice president under Obama. He had the Northern Triangle. She had asked for the voting rights portfolio. So at one point, a, a good friend of Biden's asked him, how's she doing? And he turned to her and he said, well, he said, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated relationship. On, on the other hand, he's, Biden has given her some important national security responsibilities. Uh, by all accounts, she's handled them well. There's a great story I tell in the book about uh, Harris meeting privately with Volodymyr Zelensky on the eve of the invasion. Uh, where Zelensky is still skeptical. Uh, maybe that's all I'll say, and without giving away a spoiler, but it's a, it's a great story. Yeah, I remember. It's a great story in the book. Um, Secret Service. Um, Biden's distrustful of the Secret Service, at yeah. least was at first. Maybe you can talk I about that I found this bit. really surprising and startling. Um, early on, Biden, as vi Biden during the transition, had a very good relationship with it, the head of his Secret Service detail, and I, I don't think he had a history of any, any problems. But when he became president, that detail suddenly became enormous. And among his detail were some, clear, clearly were some MAGA sympathizers. Uh, this bothered Biden on a number of levels. Um, I don't think he ever felt that they wouldn't protect, protect him. But there's a tradition in this country of, uh, where the Secret Service checks its politics at the door. Uh, they're supposed to be apolitical, nonpartisan creatures. That, that's supposed to be their DNA. And all you need to know for context here is that Donald Trump spent four years doing everything in his power to politicize the Secret Service. He hmm. took his most loyal agent and promoted him to Deputy White House Chief of Staff for Operations, which was a boldly political, unprecedented move. And don't forget, on, the, on January 6, Mike Pence, in the loading dock of the Capitol building, refused to get into, this, his car, into the car with a Secret Service detail because God only knew where they might take him. That was his attitude. Uh, he thought they might have been part of the, the MAGA plot. So that's the context for this, and I think it should, it should trouble, uh, it should trouble us um, that the President of the United States can't necessarily trust these guys to keep his secrets. Okay, so we've come to the end, um, sadly, because this has been just fascinating, uh, but uh, I need to ask you a question, and uh, my question is, Biden's popularity rating is uh, around 42 uh, percent. Uh, he, many say he's too old to be president or to run again. Uh, has he won the fight of his life or is the jury still out? The jury is well and truly out. Um, it's a political thriller, I said before, in, and it's a thriller with no ending yet. Um, I think that when it comes to approval ratings, they're not what they used to be. Um, you know, we're living in much more partisan times than ever, and I think it's harder to have a high approval rating given the divisions in the country. And Ron Klain likes to point out that at this point in his presidency, Reagan's approval rating was 33%. Biden's is 42, as you pointed out. Um, he's got tremendous challenges ahead. This is an octogenarian running a bruising re-election battle, or soon to be running one. 
Uh, he's got an untested new chief of staff. I think Jeff Snyder is a tremendously talented. He's a genius at making government work. He's a great manager, but he doesn't have that long relationship with the boss or Ron Klein's political savvy. Uh, I think that Joe Biden not only has to do all the obvious things, avoid a recession, control inflation, all of the things we expect him to do, but he also has to, I think, uh, make clear, underline, and reemphasize the stakes of defeating Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. For Vladimir Putin, conquering Ukraine is existential. For the U.S. and the West, stopping him is existential. I think Biden believes that, and I think um, that's going to be and has been the fight of his life. So the answer is the fight of his life is existential. So Chris Whipple, thank you so much for coming by. This has been just marvelous. And uh, thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care, be well, and all the best.